Hello, everybody. You should just be getting into the webinar today via GoTo. Um, it'll probably just take you a few moments to orientate yourself to make sure you can hear what's going on and see what's going on. So I'll just give you a few moments to make allow that to happen. And just while you're orientating yourself, um, for those of you that haven't used GoTo before, it should just pretty much be a, a sit back and, and let the, the software do its job, really. So while that's happening, um, let's just make sure that everyone is happy to start. Let me just minimize this down. Here we go. Right. So a big welcome to you all from Contact to Family and Sensory Works. We're very excited to have you here today for our workshop on understanding sensory processing. So the workshop today is going to run till 12 o'clock today. And we're very excited to be able to bring you this information. So I'm going to start talking you through the, the introduction pages now. So if we go on to the next page, thank you. Right, here we go. So the first thing to just let you know about, obviously with lockdown, new lockdown, Mark II, we're all working from home. It's less than ideal. Um, whilst I'm the presentation is running, um, I'm not the main presenter today, so I'm going to have my microphone off and everybody else will have uh, been muted to, to save any interference of background noise. Um, however, working at home, I have dogs. So you can bet your bottom dollar when uh, I need to say something, that's when the dogs are going to bark as they just did at the beginning. <laughs> so um, bear with us. It's the first time I myself have used this software. Um, so do bear with us if we get any technical hitches we we'll obviously do our best to sort them out as soon as we possibly can. Those of you joining by PC, laptop, tablet, smartphone, you should all now be able to see the slides as we're talking you through them now. Um, so you'll also see that there is a, a chat uh, area. So if any of you have any um, questions or you have any problems as we go forward you can communicate with me via that chat you can just type in a question if you think that's um something you'd like to know and if you can see on your control panel there's like a question mark and if you if you click on that that should bring up your chat option so you can then type in your question and we'll either do our best if i think that that question is relevant to the webinar as we're going through um, we will ask it and get an answer live as we're walk walking you through the webinar um, however if it's a question that is best placed at the end the main presenter claire is going to ensure there's a good amount of time at the end of the webinar today to answer as many questions as we possibly can okay so jumping forward another slide there please thank you so just a little bit of intro about myself before i hand you on to claire the main presenter for today um so my name is charlie kenobi and i'm one of um contacts parent um carer consultant trainers and i've been facilitating for around 12 years uh, mainly in the field of personal development um but I have two sons myself that both have very different uh, additional needs. One of my sons has to overcome quite a lot of cognitive and physical challenges from an acquired brain injury uh, was through an illness. And my older son has autism spectrum condition with an extreme demand profile. And he himself has actually um, undergone sensory integration therapy. So between both boys, I've got um, quite a lot of um, um, layperson's experience of the sensory processing disorders and differences. Um, but I'm really excited to be able to help share this webinar with you all today because it's my personal belief that I think actually many of our children with additional needs have in some way are affected by having some kind of sensory processing difference. So in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to our main presenter today, which is Claire Sterland. 
Um, so Claire is an occupational therapist and we're very lucky to have her today because she's also a sensory integration therapist with over 14 years of experience. And she's also the co-founder of the organisation Sensory Works. So I'm going to hand you over to Claire and I hope everybody enjoys this morning's webinar. Thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Charlie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Claire Sterland, as we've already established. Um, uh, I have both a, a huge professional interest in um, sensory processing issues, um, but I have a significant personal interest, both from my own point of view, in that I had many sensory differences growing up, and um, learning about sensory processing has brought great acceptance of myself and my experiences um, from being very very young and my experience of the education system through to now and I also have a child who has a fairly significant sensory processing issues she has a diagnosis of autism um, and um, she's eight years old and I know from my own point of view from her point of view what a huge difference understanding sensory development before we even get on to sensory processing issues can have on my acceptance of myself my ability to help my daughter and to enjoy my daughter and if i can do anything then today what i want to do is kind of spread that word a little bit and that's certainly why we set up sensory works in the first place um, Having worked for many, many years within the NHS and um, in, in many guises as an occupational therapist, what, I, what became very clear to me was that um, many of my colleagues who are great professionals, who I have a huge amount of respect for, don't work from a developmental perspective. So just to clarify that, the reason that many people who have any developmental difficulty or different experience sensory issues is that your whole foundation development is your sensory development. Um, and that's because every part of our sensory systems, and this is what we're going to talk a little bit about today, it, every part of our sensory systems, every part that we have, if that wasn't there, we wouldn't understand the world in the same way. Our senses are our lenses, our glasses to the world. Uh, and therefore, if our senses don't develop in the same way as the majority of people, so that we don't have developmental difference, then our understanding of the world can be different and therefore we will respond differently to the world. So I want you to imagine for a moment that I took your senses away, what would you know? How would you respond in the world? Um, and, and the answer is that you wouldn't know very much at all. In fact, you wouldn't even understand that you were an entity separate from the rest of the world. Um, and that's because your senses give you so much information about your own body and how you exist as part of something else. Um, and that that is so fundamental to our development that anybody who experiences difference, both from how they how they experience the world as far as if they have health needs um, have gone through neonatal care or if they were delayed in parts of their development they maybe didn't walk as soon as everybody else that can have an impact on your sensory development but equally if you struggle with your, your sensory development per se that can impact all of those milestones after working in the NHS for a number of years, um, working with adults with learning disabilities was where I did a, a, a prolonged period initially. Um, I discovered that there were a, a large number of people that I worked with who showed me differences in the way that they responded to the world. And some of them were very emotional and some of them were very aggressive and some of those things were extreme and some of those were subtle. But what I knew from working with adults with learning disabilities, and, and just to kind of clarify that, having a, a, a diagnosis of a learning disability as an adult means that you have an IQ under 70. That meant that a lot of the behavioural reasoning that we all applied to those people 
didn't really apply because if you have an IQ under 70 and significantly under 70, your ability to be able to predict and decide what you were going to do and your ability to try and manipulate others is significantly limited. And therefore, us dealing with that in a very behavioural management kind of a way that meant people were restricted in what they were able to do at times because of their responses. It just didn't apply. And those things that for some of those people that were into their 60s and 70s by this point, we'd been trying behavioural management for a good 50 years of their lives and it still wasn't working. Then my reasoning had to take me to, we need to look at something different because that's not been working for 50 years. So we, we, we don't lose anything by trying anything different. And when we started looking at people from a developmental point of view to understand their reactions and understand what was going on in their senses developmentally, their responses started to make sense. And it wasn't just that they began to make sense, but then we were able to engage with those people in a different way and achieve a different outcome. I don't have a magic wand. I don't make things disappear like that and I don't want people to change unless something is a problem for them but where someone's showing something that is problematic for them or for people around them we might call that dysfunctional and um, then that's when we want to start having a look at understanding what's happening and supporting change where we can and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today but we're going to do that within the context of 2020. So 2020 has been a challenging year for all of us um, and I know myself in, I, in the unpredictability of the world that this year has been very, very stressful. Now, as we go through, and I'm going to change the slide in a minute, as we go through, we're going to talk about how sensory issues can um, manifest as highly anxiety uh, provoking. Um, and the, the need for control in people who have sensory processing issues is significant. So if you have a world where no one knows what's going to happen and we can't support predictability because we don't we don't know what the definites are, then that's going to cause us some problems and we're going to talk about that. But the biggest piece of, of information that is going to help is understanding sensory issues generally because when you have that perspective it makes the way forward in unpredictable times so much easier for us who either have sensory differences or support people with sensory differences. Okay, so our aims today are to talk about what sensory needs are, how they then manifest in anxiety, um, and the impact of that change, like we've just talked about. Um, we're going to reflect on how that impacts not just that person, but on the people around them, those people that are supporting them, the rest of the family. And I'm going to kind of just rest upon briefly the impact on siblings too. Um, I'm going to consider how we have, how this changes when moving forward and times are changing and we're, we're coming to what was initially built as a new normal, but I'm not finding any consistent normal at the moment that we, we can reflect on, but we're, we're going to go with that as a, as a way forward. How are, how are we achieving a way forward and how does that impact us as sensory needs? Um, and how understanding all of this can help us to achieve well-being, not just for that person, but for the wider family and, and anyone supporting. We're going to talk about strategies because that's going to help us to work out what things apply to us and, and what things we can try and it's going to give us back a sense of control because control tends to be quite a significant conversation not only for those people who demonstrate a kind of demand avoidant um, perspective but, but for anybody where they experience any level of anxiety and we know already that sensory issues manifest as anxiety to, in some ways and I'll talk about that but if you're around somebody who has unpredictable anxiety, then that's quite anxiety provoking for us. And we want to think about how an ability to just feel in control can support us too. And that's so important because our well-being then extends to whoever we're so supporting, caring for, whether it be directly for children, adults or others. Okay. 
So for, for many of you, you will, we will have talked about this before, or you will, will have gone through this before, but to make sure that we're all starting off from, from the same viewpoint, I want to just talk to you about the senses. Now our senses are so significant to us as, as kind of evolutionary beings. And that makes it sound really fancy. And, and you'll hear lots of terms referred to about sense, uh, sensory integration, sensory processing, because very often there are lots of complicated words and ways of describing it and different versions of information. And, and we're going to try and simplify that as much as possible to make the message as clear as we can today. Um, but if anybody has any questions about any of that, then please do forward those, because I'll be happy to clarify anything if, if anybody's unsure. But our, our sensory systems, uh, for the bit that, that we look at for how somebody presents and how they, what we call, regulate, balance their senses, how they achieve a sense of well-being and calm, comes from a fairly simple mechanism. And it comes from the fact that our bodies need to be able to pay attention to the world to find food and to stay alive and to be able to detect when we're in danger. So can I smell that bacon in the pan to make sure I get some bacon too? Or can I see when a lorry's coming towards me so that I can move out of the way? So it works by attention and then by fight or flight. Do I need to move quickly? Do I need to protect myself? Do I need to survive? And for each of our senses, how that works is kind of the center of it. There's lots of things going on in the periphery, but in the center of it for this, it's whether you produce, how much adrenaline you produce depending on what's coming in. So for example, when I am waking up in the morning and I'm still kind of in that drowsy state, if my husband puts the light on next to me, I will get a level of adrenaline that brings me into consciousness, allows me to pay that small amount of attention. And actually, if he's just getting up to let the dog in the garden, then I'll absorb that adrenaline and rest back and I can snooze for a little bit longer and that's fine. If, however, we all now experienced a lion storming through our door, door into the room that we're in, we would produce a very high level of adrenaline that would put us into fight or flight for action. And each of our senses works this way. Unfortunately, if your sensory development hasn't happened as efficiently as other people, it hasn't happened um, to in the same way as the majority of people, then we will produce a different level of adrenaline than most other people for the information coming in. And therefore, sometimes we will react to the light as if a lion's walked in the room, and sometimes to the lion as if a light's gone on. And that means that sometimes we're not aware of things that we need to be aware of, and at other times, we will feel like something is incredibly threatening that just doesn't pose a physical or, or danger threat to us. So you will all probably recognize elements of that in whoever that you, whether it's yourself or someone that you care for, in the way that they react. And what happens is this then looks like, can look like a behavioral outburst or those things that we like to call challenging behavior can occur and we can't find a trigger for it. And the reason that we can't find a trigger for it is that that person themselves may not know what caused that reaction. It may co come from the ticking of a clock. It may come from the sound of a car going down a nearby road. It might come from a flickering light that I haven't even registered. And because this reaction is a hormonal reaction, it's not a cognitive process, I can't always register what causes it. So I can't explain it to you, but equally, it's very, very difficult for me to talk myself back down that because it's not a cognitive process. And that feeling of threat may continue there 
even if you're telling me I'm okay. And that can happen for each of our senses. And for those of you that don't know, we generally talk about seven senses. There's some argument over whether there's an eighth sense, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But we have the senses that we all tend to learn about in school, our sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And then we have our proprioceptive system, the proprioception, and our vestibular system. Now, they sound really grand, and actually they're not. Our proprioceptive system is just the information that we get in from our muscles and our joints little receptors in there that tell our brain where our body is without us having to look. So I wonder how many of you right now have your legs crossed. And I would bet very few of you had to watch yourself cross your legs to accurately cross your legs. And all of a sudden, now that I've said that, you probably feel your legs crossed quite a lot and kind of want to, to uncross them at this point. And that's your proprioceptive system feeding back to your brain so that you know where your body is. Is it planted? Is it safe? Is it going to fall over? Um, and that feeds back to this little map your brain has of your body that you create in development to understand what does your body consist of. And then we have our vestibular system. And our vestibular system is our movement system. And it works because it comes from our inner ear. So our inner ear has a few different types of receptors that detect different types of movement. And this allows us mm -hmm. to understand where we are in space, to understand gravity, height, and direction. Now, these systems are very fundamental to development and are a big part of the first year to two years of our lives. And therefore, we often see children who've experienced disruption at that point in their lives go on to have difficulty with those systems. Often, we don't know what's chicken and egg, so we don't know whether it's the sensory systems that have then resulted in the developmental change or whether it is a developmental difference that's then changed your sensory systems. But what we know is that your sensory development doesn't happen in isolation. So you don't develop your vision by itself and alongside that your smell and your proprioceptive system and your movement system. They are all integrated together because I don't know how to move my body or use my understanding of myself without having vision for the environment to know how I need to move it. So if I'm coming up to a step, if I can't integrate vision with movement and my body position, I'm not going to be very effective at getting up that step. So these things can't happen one by one. They all happen together. And therefore, if you have disruption to one of them, the development of one of them, it's likely that it will be far wider than just that one system that's impacted. And therefore, those people go on to have a wider issue. It's almost impossible to have one system alone that causes a problem as part of a sensory processing issue. Um, so that just a little bit of clarity around that, really. Um, each of these systems works um, by producing that amount of adrenaline. And so when you have a sensory processing issue, you can very often be oversensitive or undersensitive to these systems. And that produces this fight, flight or freeze reaction at times when you are oversensitive to any one of those. So if I feel one of those senses more than you do, so it's a bit like you might feel movement at 20 miles an hour, but I can detect it at five miles an hour. And therefore, I am far more sensitive than you. So if we start going 100 miles an hour, I'm going to be there before you. And I react from that. And therefore, that creates those defensive reactions that you will often see in people with the issue. And there's a number of ways that that can present. When I say this, it makes everybody who has a sensory issue sound like they're gonna be challenging and aggressive and difficult. It's not, this is the easiest way to explain it, but those feelings and those, that way of fight or flight can often appear as freeze. And freeze tends to be more of our kind of masking response our ability to suppress it to survive. 
um, and, and that can proceed very differently. And I'll mention that a little bit more as we go forward. Okay, so when we are feeling very sensitive to something, so I'm going to give you the example that I give to everybody. And my poor husband, who is absolutely delightful, I love him to pieces. He's a very kind and gentle man, um, and we get on really well. But every so often, he will come into the room at 10 o'clock at night with the biggest ball of cornflakes you can ever imagine, or it looks that way to me. And straight away, my hackles go up. And my hackles go up because I can anticipate the feeling that I am about to get. And through the first spoon of the cornflakes and the crunch and the slight slurp of the milk, followed by the clink of the spoon on the bottom of the bowl, make my stomach start to knot. By the third spoonful, my shoulders have come up and tensed. I feel more tense. I'm getting angry and this man that I love dearly, all of a sudden, I feel so angry that I could potentially punch him. I wouldn't because I love him to pieces and I can cognitively override that feeling because I want to stay married to him. But at that point, that tightness in my stomach, that anxiety, that gnawing, could make me feel like I was growing around the twist if I didn't understand that I'm simply very sensitive to some sound information. And when he comes in with that ball of cornflakes, I have very few options. The options are that I can leave the room, but being the 44 year old lady that I am, I am so obstinate that I do not want to leave my living room when I want to watch the TV at 10 o'clock at night before I shortly go to bed. I can cover that sound up with something else. And usually I resort to Doritos and carry on eating the big bag of Doritos until he's finished that bowl of cornflakes. And when I eat something, I mask the noise coming in through my ears and the sound of me eating is far louder than anything he can produce. I can be really, really mean to him so that he goes away or I can punch him. And again, we've already decided that's not an option for me as a relatively well-functioning adult. If I'm mean to him too much and try to get him to go away too much, it's likely we're not going to stay married long either. So I count that one out as much as I can. Although I have to admit, sometimes I do get quite snappy with him over it. And then that leaves me the leaving or the masking. So generally, I keep with the Doritos and me not being able to lose me last half a stone of weight is all my husband's fault. But I can live with that better than I can live with the conflict. But the point to all of this is that anyone who's experiencing oversensitivity as part of a sensory processing issue has those same options. Not everybody with a sensory processing issue has the emotional maturity, the social understanding, or the ability to override those feelings as well as maybe I've gained in my 44 years. Now that may be because they are too young, they're still children. That may be because they have a learning difficulty or disability. Um, it may be that they don't have that impulse control in quite the same way. And then you can understand if you look at this, how people could get to really not coping if those are the options. The other thing that I want you to think about is that so many people that we will care about who have a sensory processing issue often don't have a huge amount of control over their lives. That's certainly true of children. They can't decide when to leave an environment. They can't always change the environment to suit them. They can't always find a suitable way of masking that sound. And therefore, when they resort to hitting out, shouting and making that stimulus go away, they then experience the behavioral management response that will eat away at their self-esteem. And to ask them to do differently 
is a really tricky thing because we're dealing with an evolutionary safeguarding mechanism to allow us to stay alive. So it's a bit like me asking you to stand in, in the middle of a, of a major motorway with a 10 ton truck coming towards you at 70 miles an hour and telling you to stay there. Because at some point, your body will take over and you will make yourself leave that point. And there is no amount of um, consequence, bribery or anything else that's going to change that response. And that's why very often we see people who have sensory issues who don't respond to behavioural management. And where we have anyone not responding to behavioural management over a long period of time, we have to query whether there is an influence of sensory processing issues there to make sure that we've considered every option and to achieve the best outcome. Um, so that's really very important. Uh-huh. There's a really relevant question that somebody's asked that um, you've kind of started to touch on this. So I thought it'd be a good point just to ask it. Um, okay. It was just in regards to, do we in the UK actually diagnose um, sensory processing disorders on their own? Um, or, you know, aside from them being an aspect of AS? That's an absolutely brilliant question. And, and one that I often cover in, in quite a lot more detail. Um, than we had planned to today, so it's a really good question. Um, sensory processing disorder in itself does not exist as a separate diagnosis in the doctor's manuals of mental health issues. And therefore, technically, nobody can diagnose it. However, it is a, um, a, a collective set of, of issues and experiences and um, uh, uh, physiological responses that are widely accepted as a shared experience that we it's likely at some point will be considered as a diagnosis and we know in as a community of people that work behind the scenes around um, sensory issues um, and sensory processing disorder and I would much rather call it sensory processing disorder if it helped people to establish that we're all talking about the same thing because for me as someone who has experienced some of this stuff and the way that I watch my daughter manage within the world for her that understanding that she is not alone with this and my experience as a parent where things sometimes feel very wrong to find community with other people that have a shared experience is so very important to me that for me, I want us to call it whatever we need to, that people can find each other and share that experience together. But you're absolutely spot on. It isn't diagnosed separately in the UK currently. Now, what we do know, uh, we've got lots of evidence around the prevalence of sensory processing issues and, and more work's been done around that all of the time. And there is a very high percentage of people with autism who um, or who are autistic that have sensory processing issues. It's very high. And we know that people with ADHD and other developmental issues, um, particularly around a neurodevelopmental difference, that will have sensory processing issues. We know that there's a very high prevalence mm -hmm. of children who've had developmental difficulties as far as health crises in early parts of their life that are more, much more likely, although it's not exclusive, it doesn't mean definitely that you will have sensory issues. So it's an area of, of understanding that needs developing, but no, it, it isn't as yet a separate diagnosis. Um, but that's part of what we're trying to do here at Sensory Works and at many other organisations through the country to, to help improve that understanding as people working on providing the evidence there's those of us that collect that evidence and apply it day to day and try and reach as many people as we can. Um, if that doesn't totally answer your question, please ask me another one and I'll, I'll clarify a bit more, um, but a really great question to interrupt with. Um, so, we've already talked about either being oversensitive or undersensitive to some of this information. Now, if I'm undersensitive to information, that's tricky because if I am someone who needs an awful lot more movement than somebody else. So for example, if I, instead of being sensitive to that movement, if I don't register movement until I'm going 100 miles an hour, 
and everybody else feels it at 10 miles an hour, I'm going to feel totally under aroused, un where I can't pay attention unless I get more movement. And these are often our people. And it's not just exclusive, exclusive to that movement system, it's across all of those systems. This is just the example that helps me explain. But these are the people who move and shake and climb at all costs, that they find it intensely uncomfortable to sit still. Now, what we do know is that when someone's sensory systems aren't, the needs of their sensory systems aren't met, whether they're being, whether they're being overwhelmed with information because they're oversensitive to some information or they're being, they're not getting enough to bring them into attention to be able to function, they can't give us the best of themselves. So if they're children, they can't learn and develop the, in the way that they have potential to do if we don't balance out those systems and meet those needs. To give you a bit more of an example of that, if we're looking at adrenaline systems, we, we know that that adrenaline response that we talk about as part of sensory issue, if you get a full on fight, fight fight or flight response, so you get a massive hit of adrenaline in your body, blood moves from non-essential areas of your body to go into your muscles and tissues for action, to make you bigger, to make you stronger, to make you more successful with that lion in the room. So that redirects lots of oxygen and lots of glucose, sugar, to power your muscles. And that's why lots of people who are in an adrenaline rush appear far more, uh, have greater strength than they actually really do. And, um, you know, when you hear of those examples of mums who can lift cars off their babies and, 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 and things like that, that comes from that adrenaline reaction um, for survival. When that happens, your blood leaves parts of your brain that aren't required for you to survive. So at times when I'm trying to survive, I lose the power of my memory because I don't need it. And actually, it could be quite a negative thing to, to take a traumatic experience with me. I lose some of my communication center. Now, if I already have a diagnosis that impacts my ability to communicate, that ability to communicate deteriorates further when I experience fight or flight and my problem solving grows. Now, memory, problem solving, and communication are absolutely essential to learning and development for children. So if we don't get this right, we significantly impact the potential of our children, um, but equally in functioning. What I want you to imagine is that you will all have feelings that you can relate to with this, because sensory processing issues are, are, are just, a, in many ways, an exaggeration of what we all feel. So we're getting way too much for those systems or not enough from those systems. So you all know what it, it's like to be overwhelmed by information, whether that's through the experience of someone eating cornflakes, the sound of someone breathing when they eat, or whether it's the sensation of some clothes that just make you want to rip that top off you because it's so, it hurts, it's uncomfortable. I always think of the nice um, pure wool jumpers my mum used to put me in when I was a kid and by the end of the day, it just felt horrendous and I couldn't concentrate on anything else. Now having an experience like that doesn't mean that you have a sensory processing issue but if you see a collection of, of things that are not right within sensory development and therefore sure poor skill and difficulties in a number of different areas that's when we start to consider is this more of a, a more developmental sensory issue or a sensory processing disorder. And what we see when we have a sensory processing disorder is not just that somebody is oversensitive to one thing or undersensitive to another. At varying times, they will be oversensitive. Other times, they will be undersensitive and it will fluctuate day to day and throughout the week. And that's just the same as me. So at 10 o'clock at night, I cannot tolerate my husband eating cornflakes. But I never even notice him eating them at seven o'clock in the morning when we're having breakfast. And that's because those adrenaline reactions that have happened to me during the day 
they're cumulative and I can only take so much adrenaline through my day and then we start kind of getting on to a, a long term kind of stress response, anxiety response. And that means I'm more heightened and I wait for the next threat, the next lie and walking in through the door. So think about times when you felt particularly sensitive, if you've had an argument with somebody and then you snap at the next person that you speak to. That, that's kind of the, the tolerance reducing for the challenge coming at you. Um, and that comes very much from that adrenaline experience. And that happens if I've got a sensory processing issue more acutely. So if I've got a sensory processing issue, I am more likely then to have fluctuations in what I can tolerate and therefore be more unpredictable. And therefore, very often people will say, well, it can't be sensory because they were fine with that yesterday. And I would expect people to fluctuate more rapidly with what they will tolerate and what they want when they have a core sensory developmental issue. Okay. And just to very quickly clarify this a little bit more before we move on to the meat of what we want to talk about today. Um, when, we, when we consider how people function with sensory information, I want you to think about when you're just coming around in the morning, before my husband's put that light on in the bedroom, then I am kind of at that point where if my husband says to me, what's for dinner today? And I'm just like, huh? Huh? I can't quite function yet. I'm under aroused. I haven't got enough adrenaline in my system to be able to function and to give a clear answer that's correct, to be able to communicate effectively. Um, but if I then sit myself up in bed and alert my movement system, which is in my inner ear, and I start stretching those muscles from that proprioceptive system, and I, I start to kind of wiggle my feet in the duvet to get some touch input, I start to create a bit of adrenaline for myself. And even better, if my husband brings me a cup of tea and I have a little drink of that, then I will move myself from being under aroused with increased adrenaline into the middle zone of, of what I would say is optimal functioning. That makes it sound dead grand again. But essentially, if you imagine this as rungs on a ladder, ladder, the bottom one, relatively small. We spend a little bit of our day in that. Um, then I move with adrenaline into the next running of the ladder, which imagine is really fat because most of us spend most of our day in there. When I'm working, when I'm driving my car, when I'm thinking of what I need to sort out from the shops and get the litman for lunch tomorrow, um, all of those things, I'm in that zone. And generally, I'm quite well emotionally regulated and calm. I'm awake. I can give attention. I'm going to think about what I say before I do it. I'm aware of social boundaries and I can react appropriately. I'm orientated to what's going on so I know where I am and what's happening and I'm alert. That's how most of us function most of the time. But if you give me a whole load of sugar, a whole load of caffeine, put me on a couple of roller coasters and I will quickly go from that optimal functioning into being overstimulated when I'm adrenaline fueled and my memory deteriorates I can become disorientated I can say the wrong thing I'm not as aware of what's socially appropriate I'm likely to snap at people or, or not even say things that are true not because I'm meaning to but because I'm just in such a world that I say the first thing come, that comes out of my Mouth. I might avoid things that I don't want to do and I can't pay attention very well to more complex tasks. As a fully functioning adult, roughly, I know when I feel like that and I can begin to bring myself down and usually what I will do is go home, get under the duvet, I might have some warm milk, but I'm definitely going to very quickly go down to that under aroused um, rung of the ladder, which allows me to calm and reduce the impact of that experience. But if I go up and down on adrenaline in that fashion throughout my day, I am going to be exhausted. And the more unpredictability I have in my day and through my week, the more I will fluctuate through these things more quickly. And that happens for all of us anyway, with a sensory processing issue or not. Now, if we have a sensory processing disorder or a sensory processing um, developmental processing issue, then what happens is that middle rung of the ladder becomes minuscule, minute, 
and people tend to then flip between being under aroused and all the stimulated regularly through their day and it's a bit like us if we were going to experience very very stressful things recurrently all of the time we're going to be exhausted we're going to struggle to find our functional selves and therefore our responses are going to be erratic and we're not going to comply and engage in quite the same way as everybody else and that's problematic that's problematic to well-being it's problematic to functioning it's certainly for our children problematic to development and learning okay so i would imagine that many people who, who are joining us today experience someone who can be very controlling and controlling can be lots of different versions of controlling so my little girl who is eight will very much play games but change the rules as we go constantly because that's her way of maintaining control she will tell me what order i can put my clothes on not just hers and she does it all in a very friendly playful way but she's very good at controlling exactly who's doing what when to make her world more predictable because one thing she can't cope with is unpredictability she cannot do it because otherwise that those rooms of that ladder go up and down even more and i fit, and she ends up feeling exhausted and not being able to cope and she knows that if she can't cope she'll often experience behavioral consequences that she hasn't intended to do but she's ended up in that place and it's a bit like you or i you know if we've come home from from work or from a really tough day and we end up being snappy or difficult or we just don't want to do it but this is just that we mean somebody with a sensory processing issue is more likely to have difficulty in managing ourselves whilst experiencing that and we experience it more acutely and more often and therefore our ability to be able to cope overall deteriorates if I've got a sensory processing issue, I am going to be inconsistent. And because of this adrenaline response, it manifests as what looks like an anxiety. And whilst it isn't based on kind of trauma or experience, the response physiologically is still anxiety. So a lot of the physical effects of a sensory processing issue can look very much like an anxiety but won't always respond to the methods that we would use from a kind of cognitive uh, behavioural approach around anxiety to support people because it simply doesn't sit within that realm and therefore we need to look at physical regulation of that response through sensory um, support um, and um, coping strategies and we may then look to sensory integration to support that going forward to reduce the impact of that we are more likely to be supporting someone who can be aggressive or violent and it might be unlike them and their personality but every so often when things really struggle and particularly that this year i've perhaps seen that more acutely with my little girl um, and that hasn't been something we've experienced as much before this year i know we see lots of emotion very extreme emotions from my girl um, and again this manifests best so it shows very differently in different people that doesn't mean to say it doesn't come from the same reactions it's just the same as you or i in a very stressful situation so perhaps perhaps if i'm kind of walking down a dark alley and i hear someone walking behind me and i'm not sure what's going on and i get that feeling of i don't feel safe some of us will freeze some of us will run but actually it's the same response it's just that we've managed that in a different way and that would be the same with people who react differently from a sensory point of view we know that people are more likely to have a communication it's a persistent communication issue a developmental communication issue alongside having sensory issues because of that factor of social communication to, um, difficulties um, but we also know that if people are going to experience varying adrenaline levels their communication skills within their higher executive functions are going to deteriorate regularly and therefore their ability to, to have confidence in their own communication also deteriorates 
and makes them more anxious about the need to communicate when they're uncomfortable. We're going to have varying attention and concentration because if my ability to be able to attend to the thing that matters to me, so for example, how do, when you know when you, if you're at home and if your house is anything like mine, I have a dog that barks, a husband that watches two TVs at once, and um, I have my laptop going, the cooker going, my daughter doing some homework on the laptop elsewhere if we ever manage to get to the homework bit. Um, and there's music on in the background and the builders upstairs sorting out the loft. How do I know when to ignore that information or when I need to pay attention to it? And that comes very much from my sensory systems that allow me to understand by that adrenaline response which thing needs my attention. So how do our children in school understand that they need to listen to their teacher, but they don't need to listen to the other 30 children in the class? And it's through the same mechanism that it's how much adrenaline that stimulus produces for them. If that system isn't working, I am going to ignore things and not create the right level of attention for the things that are important. So me being able to respond when my daughter shouts help comes from that system that allows me to ignore my husband asking me to pass him the chocolate or make him a cup of tea. It's technically the same thing and it doesn't work as well for people with sensory processing issues. It's the same thing. The reason that it, it makes life more stressful and creates actually more anxiety too is that if you have that much stimulus coming in, some of which you're very sensitive to, um, that you can't work out which bits you need to ignore and which bits you need to pay attention to. It's a bit like me putting a thousand radios on in a room and expecting you to listen to Radio 2 and give me the details of Radio 2. Now, if they're all at the same volume, you're not going to be able to do that. But that's what life can feel like from lots of different sensors for somebody with a sensory issue, that they can't work out which thing they need to focus on. Now, these all, all of these things happen. Um, and sometimes they happen to one person in a family and sometimes they happen to multiple people in a family because it's really interesting how many people in families have a shared experience. So I have um, siblings and other people around me in my family who experience many of these things. Now, if I'm someone who experiences a sensory processing issue and this is the impact, then having other people around me who aren't very predictable, who might have difficulty in producing the right level of communication and may be more emotional and unpredictable makes my life more difficult. So that impact can, can kind of bounce off each other in a family or in a shared experience. But that also means even if you don't have a sensory processing issue, the level of anxiety that you will experience around working with somebody um, by caring for somebody with, with a sensory processing issue means that you're at the mercy of a lot of these impacts, which means I need you to look after yourself because if you don't look after yourself, this, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We have to look after these things. And by understanding these things are happening, we can use some of the strategies for ourselves to support us in dealing with these things day to day and getting the best outcomes for the people that we care about. Okay. So if we're going to help somebody with sensory issues to balance out those sensory needs, what we're going to do is look at, look at the, the responses they give us. So when my daughter is really struggling, she is going to be very emotional in certain circumstances. Or very often she's going to do things like really fist her hands and flick her joints. And that's telling me she needs something at that point. So firstly, that gives me a clue. When does that happen? Does it happen frequently? Does it happen when she's on her way to school? Does it happen before she sits down to lunch? And that's going to give me a little bit of a clue. What I then need to know is when does that happen and what is she getting out of that? Now, I know that if she's flicking her hands, she's looking for some more pressure through her joints. And therefore, instead of doing things in an dysfunctional way and for her that's not dysfunctional I've got no problem with her flicking her joints and doing those things if it bothered her I would want to find an alternative for her but when we get into some more dysfunctional responses for example banging your head against walls or floors um, when you're doing something that then hurts somebody else 
we need to be able to replace that with a functional alternative that gives the same kind of information, not necessarily through that particular part of the body. We're generally, because our proprioceptive system, so you, can you remember that sensation that I talked about that is about your muscles and your joints and tells you about where you are in space without you having to look. Now, if you remember nothing else today, I want you to remember proprioception. And that's because proprioception is almost universally calming. It neurologically stops us registering that, that, that adrenaline response in our body and so can reduce the impact of sensitivity to those other sensations. So even though somebody might be very sensitive to sound, I can use proprioception to help calm their response to it. I then don't have to have them avoid every sound they don't like because they might be able to cope with that sound a bit better if they have more proprioception. And that's not a problem if somebody wants to avoid that, but if they want to be able to go into an environment where it can be noisy or there's a school bell and I can give them more proprioception, then that allows them to be able to function the way they want to be able to function or it reduces the stress in having them in an environment that they need to be in, but there are elements to that that create a sensory difficulty for them. We're going to use that proprioception, and I'm going to show you some um, strategies that include lots of proprioception that are calming um, in a few slides' time. Um, we're going to use that at a time when we need them to pay more attention because we already have talked about the fact that that adrenaline response can reduce attention and concentration for anything that's important. So if I need someone to concentrate better and they are very heightened, I'm going to use proprioception with them, those calming strategies before they experience those things or during those times. Each individual person will have other elements of sensory that will help them to focus and calm or gain the right stimulus to, to, to give them enough adrenaline to, to come into it to that attention phase. Um, and that's individual to them. And that you probably either already know or can find out with the help of an assessment. Um, but these other things help us try lots of different things already that will give us a sense of control and even help ourselves to calm at times um, to be able to support them effectively. Often when we get some of this right, we then share the experience of regulation, of being able to calm down. So if my daughter, who very often likes to be able to calm in a dark, enclosed, small space, so if after school she's in a wardrobe that's very, very small, we have some small wardrobes in our house, um, she will sit there and she'll come back out when she feels okay and then she'll start to talk to me. But that experience is very isolating. An awful lot of what my daughter needs is to have a shared experience of the world and a sense of safety with other people. So if I can find calming activities that I can share with her, I can show her that I understand what's happening for her and we can calm together. And that's really quite powerful. And that often begins a communication process between carer, supporter, parent, and a person who feels very out of control because of their sensory systems and these fight or flight responses. Okay, so we've got lots of calming strategies and some of the photos here apply to different age groups um, because we want to look at the very young, but we want to look at everybody because sensory issues impact you throughout the lifespan. They're not something that goes away. They're very often something that you learn to manage better or accept about yourself as you do get older. Um, but the way that you will use some of these calming strategies will change according to your age, developmental stage, um, and your ability to be able to engage in these things or use them safely. So whilst I'm suggesting them, I'm not saying that you should use them for everyone, they're options for you to try. And where you're unsure, you really should consult with a medical professional first, particularly with items where they might involve compressing pressure and weight. Because for those of you that have heard of deep pressure, um, weighted blankets, 
compression vests, weighted vests. Those are all things that use proprioception to try and calm because proprioception works by pull, push, pressure or force. Um, because that's how our muscles work. They contract and release, contract and release. And therefore, our detection of those systems comes through force and relax, force and relax. And that's the action that allows us to block that adrenaline physiologically. So those things like deep pressure allow us to calm a person. But there's lots of ways of doing that. And actually, the more active that approach, the more significant the impact of that calm. So we can use things like a hug fest like we have on the screen there. And that basically goes around kind of your upper abdomen and chest, and you'll have two straps down that just hug you in nice and tightly. Now you must always check with medical professionals before you use um, things like hug vests, but they provide a level of pressure without somebody having to have a hands-on hug. So for people who struggle with touch information, it's a good way to get some of that pressure in there. But where somebody, for example, is getting pressure for themselves, like laying over a gym ball and creating pressure either through their abdomen or through their bot bottom by sitting on it, that's a much more powerful neurological signal that allows us to get more effect from that proprioception than just applying it to them. And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. So we have the tight fitting clothes or thermal wear, um, chewing things is a really good way because your ability to be able to both suckle and chew are very early forms of proprioception. So when you're first born, a big part of your first few moments is beginning to suckle and that involves the heavily, your mouth is almost exclusively muscle and your tongue's almost exclusively muscle and therefore you need to understand that proprioceptive system and be able to employ it to suckle effectively. So it's a huge part of early calming and regulating. So where someone's struggling, very often that's why we will see people who will continue to put things up into their mouth longer than they should, where we will continue to see them drink a lot or overfill their mouth. And so lots of people will calm with very regular snacks that allow them to chew or crunch, um, and that creates quite powerful proprioception, even if the rest of the time they use their body to get that proprioception, the mouth can be a really powerful way to do it because your mouth is one of the most sensitive places for you to receive any sensory information. Um, different types of music impact different people differently. Some people calm with heavy beat music. I don't, it makes me feel physically ill, um, a little bit like the cornflakes, although more extreme. And so I calm with music that is very predictable and uneventful. Um, but different people will have different things. Often by getting people to choose their own music, you can work out what will help to, to reduce the impact. What that does as well is block out sounds that I can't cope with. So actually, instead of eating those Doritos when my husband's eating the cornflakes, I could have my phone plugged into music with earphones in and I wouldn't hear him and then I couldn't blame him for that extra hard stone of weight that I've got. Mindfulness and things that allow you to think about each part of your body encourages that understanding of proprioception and for some people um, some of the equipment, um, gym equipment can help us to employ that system and some of that gym equipment is, is good for people who maybe don't have the coordination skills but we want them to get that muscle experience. Lots of other examples here, and some of those are everyday activities, some of those are occasional activities, um, but they give us different ways. And what I would always say is we will never get a set of um, activities or options and, and strategies that everyone will use successfully. It doesn't work like that. Just like in the group of us there are today, there'll be lots of people who like to click their pens, and there will be a, a, an equally large number of people who get really annoyed by people clicking their pens. And what we're doing there is the same thing where we're providing for a need for ourselves. We all do that differently. But what we want is a toolbox of options that allow us to try different things until we find the toolbox that best suits 
our person or ourselves. So I'm just going to go through these slides. There's lots of different options there that introduce different levels of proprioception and heavy pressure. One of the best ways that I find to calm when I'm feeling very, very uncomfortable is to take a gym ball, so your average box standard gym, gym ball that is inflated, and I find a safe wall and I throw it with force repeatedly against that wall. And after I've done about 10 throws, firstly, I'm exhausted. And secondly, I feel calmer than I do on an average day when I wake up. It provides heavy proprioception, but doesn't require the coordination skill and physical skill um, that I sorely lack with catching balls and, and playing sports and doing those things, as do so many people with sensory processing issues. So these are different ways that we can explore physical engagement that give us proprioception that don't place too much demand on us because if we try and do that in a way that places too much demand that person will avoid that avoidance may not be passive um, but it will make them feel more anxiety and make them more likely to show the very strong fight or flight response um, and you can see some pictures of younger children here with different options there Lots of options to drink thick fluids through straws, employs that mouth again, um, and lots of different ways to do that. You can buy a specialist kit to do some of this stuff, like the body sock that's on the slide, or you can use everyday activities that allow us, for example, in a classroom, for a child to move furniture around, provides them with proprioception, obviously safely done and not on their own, um, supervised. But that means that we've used their muscles just the same way that you could use some of the equipment behind me. But it gives you an option for them in everyday life so that they don't have to appear different, that they, if they, they don't want to, I've got no problem with difference. And very often my daughter has no problem with being different. Um, and so if she doesn't mind, I don't mind. But where she does mind or it causes me a problem, I want to find another way for her to do that. And what we're saying is, very often because of she's off my daughter's very often in that top rung of the ladder the red rung of the ladder of being overstimulated she doesn't choose the, the best way of engaging in that regulating activity and therefore if i can redirect her all the time to do that in a more functional way she builds the self-esteem she understands that i understand and i can communicate better with her through it okay We've also got some alerting activities on here, just to give you some examples of what I do to increase that adrenaline. Um, and these can be done in lots of different ways, um, and, but it's easier to show them in pictures for, for much younger children. Um, and I was actually in a nursery yesterday playing with that spaghetti that's on there at the moment, and I had to pretend I loved it. And I can quite honestly say I didn't because for me, that touch experience was way too uncomfortable, but those kids thought I loved it, and that's the main thing. Okay, so when we think about, at the moment, what we've experienced this year, what we've got to look at is the level of um, change people have experienced, and we've changed one way, then we've changed another, or we haven't been able to get out and experience the world in quite the same way as we ordinarily would. We haven't got the same options for regulation that we would normally have. In the last few weeks, we've had a return to school or parents or carers returning to work, and we're recreating that structure or routine. Now, for those first couple of weeks, everybody in September, when schools returned and things really ramped up into, into this new normal, we saw a couple of weeks where everybody went quiet and I was like, wow, this is really good. And then things got an awful lot more stressful very quickly from a lot of people, including me and my daughter. And essentially what happened was we got through that bit where we kind of go, oh, what are we doing? And we're functioning and we're just managing. And then actually the level of that adrenaline accumulated again over a period of time. And then we started to see those, those um, poor regulation, that buildup of adrenaline, that sensory dysregulation. And that's when we then very slowly start to see little signs that built into 
more anxiety and more difficulty. Um, and what we've got to look at is firstly understanding that. That's totally understandable that that's been happening. But with that change in routine, again, with the talk all around that we might then go back into being restricted to home and nobody knows what's going to happen between now and Christmas and moving forward. So my recommendations really would be around maintaining as much stability and, and clarity of message as we can, that we know what's happening today and we know what's happening this week for those of us who do, those, who, those of us in some areas don't really know what's happening, uh, certainly from Friday. Um, but we need to maintain that message to those around us. We need to maintain that message for us because we need to understand from our point of view, we've got to be able to deal in the things that we can control and we've got to understand the things that we can't control. And if we can't control it, we can't then give the message to the person that we care about that's going to struggle with it. So we need to be very clear about what's happening for the bit we can control. We need to be articulating our feelings about what's happening in a very clear message. So I will say to my daughter, I can feel red because I'll often talk about that feeling of the cornflake stomach where I've gone really tight and uncomfortable and I feel like I don't know what to do as red because we talk about it in red, amber and, and green. And so I will say, I feel really red right now. Are you feeling red or are you feeling amber? And we will begin that conversation. And again, that's about taking her out of the isolation of experiencing that. But it also makes me feel in control too. Because as her parent, as her parent, if she's feeling out of control, I feel out of control. And I don't know what's around the next corner of is it going to be complete emotional meltdown? Is it going to be that she's going to be avoidant, demand avoidant? Am I going to get her to eat a meal or am I going to cook 10 meals before I manage to get anything into her? All of that leaves me kind of hanging. And so if I can begin that discussion with her, we can put things into the context of what we can articulate. That doesn't apply to every family. I understand that. But where we can get that understanding in or we can use visuals to support that, that's really important. Now, I've got sensory conservation on there, which isn't a very well evidenced um, kind of theory because it's my theory and what we do is when we look at people who who very often for medical reasons need to conserve their energy we will talk about having a very clear idea of what's the most important thing to do in the day and then using the first part of your day to do the most important things and then work backwards in priority so that you also always know that when you've absolutely had enough you can stop and you've done as much as you possibly can to do the most important thing. Now, if you have a child in school, that will mean that very often being able to cope in school is your biggest priority most days, which means that sometimes I need to take the pressure off my daughter to allow her to function in school. So that will mean that some days when she's not managing well, so about a week ago when we were really struggling to get to school and to cope, then that will mean that I'll help her with dressing, even though at nearly nine years old, I know she's capable of that, but she didn't have the emotional energy, she couldn't regulate well enough to be able to do that and then go to school and cope. And that's not just to do with the skill of it, that's to do with the fact that she struggles a lot with the, the touch-based experience of clothing. If she gets home on a night, I know when she's not coping to ask her questions about what she's experienced because that might bring up more adrenaline because just like you if i start talking to you about an argument you've had you get that flare of adrenaline back through your body as you remember that argument for her if she remembers that experience during the day while she's still feeling very vulnerable it will reignite that adrenaline response and make her feel more vulnerable when she's least able to cope with it so i give her time allow her to sit in that wardrobe for a while knowing that she'll cope better later on when she she comes out of there and i don't place demands on her around homework or following routines other than the things that i know make her feel better that's what i call sensory conservation on a saturday and a sunday that's different because i know on a saturday she often needs a pajama day to be able to manage the rest of the week 
and then on other days it will be actually today's the day that we really need to get her some fun and some other opportunities outside of just school and home and so they are our priorities and everything else doesn't matter and it's about you working with whoever you care for or for yourself to understand what you need to do and when you need to stop to be able to cope with what is a marathon and not a sprint on a daily basis. Okay, so we know that routine and communication is really, really important and it's even more important at times of unpredictability. So we need to have things as repetitive as we can and routine as, as we can because then we can cope with the, the bit of change much better. Whereas if everything's changing all of the time, that's just too anxiety provoking. So I want you to think of times when you've been very, very stressed. So if I've got 100 reports to do, I've got phone calls coming in, and I'm not doing it in a structured way, and somebody says, right, I need you to go and do this, I explode with anxiety. Whereas if I know that between 9 and 11 on a morning, I do my reports, and I've done as much as I can, and then I do my telephone calls for an hour, and then I need to go and do something else, and somebody only interrupts one bit of that, I can cope with that. If everything's always changing, I can't cope, and that's the same for people with sensory issues. It's just more profound. Now, where my, my little girl is incredibly eloquent and has a massive vocabulary and speaks very, very well. But what people often misunderstand is that she is just as dependent on visuals to support her understanding and her sensory regulation, often as people who are nonverbal. Because just like you are or I, when we're struggling things, we like to be reminded of them and supported with them. So for me, every day that I come to work, if I don't know what's happening or I'm feeling stressed about what's happening, I check my phone more regularly to work out what I'm doing, in what order, and when. Often people who have sensory processing issues are people who struggle to create that kind of order for themselves and may need some support. So we may need some visuals, and it's just the same as creating a diary that supports understanding and memory. That makes the world more predictable. It also makes you feel more in control. Um, when we are experiencing, when anybody's experiencing those adrenaline fight or flight reactions, it's very important to remember that that communication center has significantly reduced. And therefore, the easiest way to help someone to cope is to reduce your language significantly. If someone is showing you control or distress, reduce your verbal interaction. Be there, be available, but don't impose language on them because that's the time when they can't cope with it. We're all the same, we just see it more acutely in people with sensory issues and particularly at times of change. Whenever you're trying to communicate something and be very, very clear, say things in the order they should or will happen. Because if you say them in a different order, people will become frustrated because they've anticipated in that order. Often with my little girl, I need to say things one, one, one at a time, otherwise she only ever hears the last thing. And then when I tell her the first thing, she gets really upset because she said, oh no, you said shoes. And now you're telling me I have to have a bath. Um, and that's really confusing for her and will increase her anxiety. It's a bit like, you know, if you're kind of getting ready for a wedding or an important day out and somebody moves all of your things out of where you think they should be and you end up getting stressed and uncomfortable. It's that kind of, but very exaggerated. We need to be very clear and make things as predictable as we can. I say child on here, but this doesn't just apply to children. Where we need attention from someone who physiologically can't give attention easily, we need to use their names very regularly to gain their attention. We need to know we've got that attention before we start conversing or giving instructions or doing anything. We need to use their name first, and then we must always tell them what to do, not what not to do. And that's because if I'm high on anxiety, I will often only hear snippets of what's going on around me. And if I happen to hear you say, don't go out on the road, I may only hear go out on the road. And that means I'm gonna do the thing, 
that I shouldn't be doing. It also applies to people where that is very, very common in people who have sensory processing issues is that their ability to be able to plan and imagine what they should do can be very difficult for them. So if you don't tell them what you want them to do, they can't imagine what you want them to do. And so if they're just left with the thing that they had in their mind they were going to do anyway, that's what they're going to do, even if you've told them not what to do. So these are good strategies to just help you day to day with people, particularly at times of change. Um, visuals include lots of different ver versions of visuals and that depends on individuals, but you can use objects and signs, photos, pictures, words. Um, we can use sequences of things, social stories. Um, I use social stories a lot to explain well after the fact. So when somebody's having an, a significant adrenaline reaction, that can stay in the body for up to two and a quarter hours, which means they're very vulnerable for two and a quarter hours. And that is not the time when I'm going to be addressing with them what's gone wrong or what was difficult or what they did wrong. Um, I'm going to leave that until well after the event, either the next day or well after that two hours that has, has passed. I'll often use social stories at that point to talk about things in the third person to explain what happened and why it was a problem and then start thinking about some of those activities in that toolbox of ways we can avoid that happening again. First and then options for visuals are very, very good for people with sensory processing issues because they tend to flit in and out of attention for us. So it's very accessible to do first and then or now and next. And and um, visuals help us really clearly to work with choice for people and to set boundaries for those children or people who are demand avoidant and it gives them a sense of it's what I've chosen even if that choice was quite structured in the first place. Okay so what I've got here is some resources that may be very useful to, to you. Now there's, there's lots of other resources available um, however, these are resources that I personally have used and have had recommended to me, which is why I've put them on there. So I hope you find some of those useful. Um, the books, the books that parents have told me gave them many ping moments, as someone once said to me, where you kind of go, oh yeah, that makes complete sense now. Um, and so, so they've been useful. Um, and even if you're not talking about your own child, this, a lot of these books are very, very much about kind of relationships and describing those relationships whilst experiencing sensory issues and how they fit into development. So I am going to pass back over to Charlie to allow her to sum us up and we'll look for any questions that we need to uh, work through. Charlie, thank you very much. much. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've gleaned quite a bit of this kind of sensory information from supporting my own sons, but that went into such more depth and I've, I've learned loads from what I could between oh, answering really good questions. Um, so should I run through questions now or should I just run through these last few slides? Shall, shall we do the slides and then we know that any time we've got left, we've got the questions. It's for questions. Great idea. OK, so just a little bit uh, for those that don't know about Contact a Family. We're an organisation that have been running for a number of years now. And um, the great thing about Contact a Family is the quality of the information that you can receive from their website, from their uh, booklets that we've created. You know it is of really top quality level information and um, there's all sorts out there on the internet and you just know that this is up to date it's um been built by professionals and they know their stuff so if you want to have a look and find out more about contact a family we have a website that you can uh, go on to and there's all sorts of areas that you could possibly think of any parent carers of any child with additional needs remember that goes up to 25 legally years old so um you know we, we cover all sorts of aspects of disability and um, topics that we can include 
are things like um, encouraging positive behaviour, well-being for parents, sleep, money matters. And, and these are all offered actually on workshops that we're delivering right into your living room at the moment via Zoom. Um, I'm one of the presenters with a whole team of others. So if you wanted to know more specifically about how to get your child to sleep or how you're possibly going to manage financially because it's costing you a lot of money to support a child with additional needs, then not only are these websites, sorry, these um workshops really fantastic you can also phone in to contact a family and we have our own specialists that are there to take your call and to give you up-to-date current information um, so we go on to the next slide i think it mentions a bit more about our services actually that would be really good to offer yeah brilliant so the listening ear service this is a relatively new service because i think what we've all experienced from the last year which claire's majorly touched on today is how stressful everything has been we've certainly been in the situation the first lockdown where we had to shield we didn't have any support we had many many hours of um personal assistance support that we couldn't access it was very stressful and if you had the time phoning in to contact to book a, a listening ear phone call um, could just take you from about to explode down to let's just take a breath here it's a fantastic service it's run by our people there at contact and you can book it via eventbrite the, the link is live on your presentation you'll receive this presentation through in a few days anyway use the service it would be a great experience to be able to talk at the very least it's somebody really knowledgeable to be able to listen and um, they go above and beyond to make sure you get the support that they could possibly offer you um, so moving forward again thank you. sorry to interrupt charlie that's such a needed service i can imagine so many families will find that so useful yeah absolutely because right now isolation is just off the chart and here in wales where i'm at, uh, speaking from today uh we're just about to go into a half term of lockdown i'm sure with many other parts of um england as well and scotland and ireland and um yeah it's it's going to be a really really necessary service and i think it's being heavily used this listening ear service so do make use of it with there for you Brilliant. Right, what have we got coming up on the next slide here? Brilliant. This was um, a great slide that just gives you um, a bit of a collage of the services that contacts offer. Um, one of the things that we do, which um, I didn't realise until I started working with contacts, is um, they campaign, they do a lot of campaign work to support children with disabilities and their parent carers. For example, there was a very successful campaign that was to do with the loss of gaining um, disability living allowance for your child if your child became hospitalised. And for anyone that's had their child in hospital, you know it's not a cheap thing you know this car parking you have to eat out three times a day virtually it's a crazy time to be taking a disability um a, you know financial support away from parents uh so that was a such successful campaign um so there's all sorts of campaign work that we do we've got the helpline i've used myself uh this this helpline very knowledgeable very helpful lovely people on the end of the phone um we've also got the fledgling shop now several of the things that claire has mentioned um well the, the fledgling shop is there to really have a whole range of different sensory aids for children with disabilities. It's really worth a look. Off the top of my head, um, I know that we sell the body socks. There's also a body sock version that you can put on beds. So the child feels quite hugged in to their bed and helps them sleep. There's all sorts of chewy toys. It's, it's everything is on there. It's really worth a good look to see whether the fledgling shop has something that's gonna help. It's kind of worth a browse too, because you might think, oh, I hadn't even considered trying something like that. Um, so I found that very useful. 
There's also uh, an awful lot of resources and information on our website. And that's probably the first thing I found useful when I found Contact a Family. Loads of books. Um, you can get them hard copy. A lot of them, um, because the information is updated so regularly to make sure that they are keeping up with current law, current um, research, it's probably best to access them online because they're updated so frequently. Um, so that's there for professionals, parent carers, anyone really that has an interest in how to support someone successfully with an additional need. Um, so take a look at our website. I think you'll be um, pleased to see the quality of support that's there. So what's our next slide there, Claire? Ah, well, that's, um, yeah, it's been fantastic to have so many participants today. Um, I've had really positive comments, uh, really interesting questions that we're going to come on to in just a second. So thank you so much for um, accessing today's webinar has been brilliant it's going to be a short questionnaire at the end we would really really value your feedback into knowing how it was for you um, as well as the platform the it platform that we've used how was that as well as the content um, if there's anything that you would like to see included perhaps wasn't things that you might have found especially useful um, so there'll also be a recording of the webinar and the presentation and that's going to be on the website in the next couple of weeks weeks so look out for news about that on our home page and our social media what's i didn't mention actually there's a fantastic um parent forum group on facebook for contact a family it's um really a safe place to be able to speak about what's hard for you and to glean the um all the information from all the parents that have found their own coping strategies over the years um, and it's a really really helpful place just to be able to feel heard and to find really practical solutions right so i think are we on to question time now claire i think we are i think we are okay. we've got a few minutes there to play with um i did notice one question as well that um, whilst I talked about diagnosis and, and technically sensory processing issue uh, disorder not having a diagnosis, what I think it's really important to say is that we yeah. can assess to work out whether this is the set of issues that's understood to be sensory processing issues. And there are a few different ways that we can do that. And the, the gold standard of that, according to the evidence, is using the sensory integration practice test. Now, this is why it's really, really important that if you are getting an assessment for someone that you care for, you use a fully qualified sensory integration therapist. Because it is only a sensory integration therapist who is qualified to use that set of tests and to be able to interpret the information that you might then get from things like the survey type assessments that you will fill in. So you can get things like the uh, sensory profile, sensory processing measure, and sensory inventory, there's many there. Um, but the information from those is just based on behavioral responses. When you use a sensory integration and practice test, which is provided by the, the, the sensory integration therapist, what they're doing is looking at how somebody developmentally and neurologically process the information so that they can work out the best way to move forward. It's not just about providing the strategies that I've talked about today. It's about looking at underlying what's happening and how best to move that forward and whether sensory integration therapy would be the best way forward, whether it would be through things like a sensory diet and other things, but it's with a real sound understanding of developmental neurology which you wouldn't necessarily get from other OTs that haven't got that qualification. It's a, it's a master's level qualification um, and, it, and it's looking at that. So that's what you're looking for for the assessment. Is somebody a sensory integration therapist and what, what assessments do they do? If anyone's unsure, you don't have to come to me for an assessment. I'm not bothered about that. But if you're unsure about what to ask for, please do contact us. You can come through our website too, just to, to use our email um, and send me a question saying, remind me, Claire, you know, this person's saying they will do this and I'll explain to you what the, the, those um, assessments are. I've got no problem doing that because my aim is very much to make sure that people receive good quality information about sensory issues um, because this is so wide of an issue. We have to move forward with it, but we've got to do it in a real quality way. 
Yeah, that's really important. Um, on that issue of diagnosis, uh, there's a question here that relates to that. Um, someone is just asking whether um, it's if if you have um, is a is a sensory processing disorder diagnosis is that important if you already have a diagnosis of ASD? I mean, I'm guessing that's probably dependent, isn't it? It is absolutely and I think it's one of those things because I think it's a very good question because a lot of the things as we offer, as overtly see as ASD are sometimes the sensory elements of it so the things that are kind of stereotypically ASD in responses sometimes then you will see those they, they are, have a sensory basis however it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about having that to kind of gain extra services or, or any of that. What comes with understanding what's happening from a sensory point of view is an understanding that we can communicate to the right people and where appropriate understanding we can give to that person themselves. I would say categorically for my daughter, the biggest change in understanding herself has come from the sensory stuff. Whilst it's important she understands the diagnosis of autism, it's the sensory stuff that helps her day to day to work out what's happening. And I think it's so powerful to see people when we talk about things. So my daughter, who we, I mean, obviously I talk about sensory issues every day, but I think she was first six when she said, mum, this person's banging their head. Do you think that's sensory? So that, oh. that became less about behavioral and bad behavior, but it became a discussion about what, do they have a need? Can I help them? Um, can I talk to anybody else about that? And that's an important change in society that we need to understand around this set of issues that is very prevalent, particularly for our children and achieving the right outcomes for our children and then achieving well-being for the adults who experience these things. Brilliant. OK, we've got a couple of specific functional questions, but just before we move on to those, um, just a quick thing on the further reading. Um, there was a participant that wanted to specifically know if the reading covered um, the evidence between the links between the sensory processing disorder and how that um, possibly links in with other diagnoses and also um, whether the reading there covered more about the diagnosis um, sorry the assessment process itself uh -huh. of the sensory mm -hmm. assessment there are the, the level of evidence now around sensory and how that sits in and and kind of some of that is contentious and some of it's not. There's, there's a, a, a phenomenal body of evidence that's building and there's a lot of work going into that currently um, and that's internationally. And that's to update our evidence around this because a lot of our original evidence around sensory issues was developed kind of, kind of 1960s onwards in the US and we now need that update and to support it going forward and, and to meet the demands of, uh, of kind of a critique of our health systems now, which is absolutely fine. I can provide you with some examples of some of that evidence. It isn't on the ones that we've got because it does tend to be quite um, academic reading. Um, there's more um, there's more therapy based, so more for your therapists and professionals um, to look around the assessment process and those kinds of things. And if that's something people would find useful, I can give you some examples of those too. Okay, and is there a place, uh, one place that you could find where a registered OT who's qualified in sensory and in integration would be? Is there like an association or is it really dependent on where you live? Mm -hmm. You can ask any OT, they should be able to tell you their qualifications. Um, and it, there's a mixed bag when it comes to NHS and, and what they will do dependent on area. Um, so some areas you will be able to access some of these services quite easily and some areas it just won't exist NHS wise um, and that's service dependent. Um, the, if you um, look at the Sensory Integration Network UK, that is the main educational body in the UK or has been. There is now another organisation which is the um, uh, classy organisation which um, a slightly newer educational organisation for sensory and they hold a lot of links but it's the sensory integration network that has a register of qualified therapists because they provide the, the therapists 
um, the, the qualifications for therapists uh, with uh, university bodies alongside them. So the Sensory Integration Network UK is a really good place for good quality information. Parents can sign up to, 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 to have a look at their information and, and get information and links from them, but also that they will have information on qualified people. But whoever you contact as a, a registered professional, they should be able to tell you their qualification as well. Um, and that way you're looking for sensory integration qualifications, usually up until this month, I think, it's been from the University of Ulster, so that should appear on, on, on their information somewhere. Okay, that's really good, useful to know. Got a couple of functional uh, questions here. Um, one of the people's left, but I'm hoping they'll be able to watch the recording. Um, she has a child that has a very pronounced facial tick, and she's wondering if that is to do with sensory processing, and if so, is there anything she can do to help um, alleviate this, this quite pronounced tick for her daughter? Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to do kind of remotely as such because ticks can be ticks and they are far more common uh, for some people with autism. Um, however, there are people that I've worked with that sometimes when we've increased the amount of proprioception they receive, that reduces somewhat. But it depends about what anxiety is going on because it could be around both a sensory thing and it may also be that generally their anxiety is building. So we need to look at that from two angles and we must always look at that. If there's a neurologist involved, we must include them in that um, to make sure we're doing everything that we should be doing. Um, but because facial tics tend to be around use, use of the muscles around the face, then it's, it's likely to relate back to that proprioceptive system. Um, but we can't say exclusively that it is. So I think it's something worth looking into with somebody who can assess. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's also another functional question from a participant. Um, her daughter is playing with her poo in the bath um, and she's wondering whether there's something she can do to help her child meet this sensory seeking behaviour. Um, there's also, you know, it's about licking the fingers. I guess there's a lot of stimulus that's going on there for that child. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, I, what I want people to know is that so, you know, I started at the very beginning saying people with sensory issues respond differently and sometimes that can be in ways that other people won't, will feel very uncomfortable with. But if you're experiencing things like that, you are not on your own at all. And, you know, we've got to be very careful around children to make sure that we're considering every option around some of those responses. But it is common for people who have sensory issues to respond in that way. I would want anyone who is experiencing and that to be consulting with whatever health professionals are around and educational professionals around that too to make sure that, that we're making sure that child is, is their well-being is as, as, as good as we can make it uh, but yes playing with poo can very much be from a sensory point of view the difficulty is is that that can come from a very tactile point of view it can come from the smell and the taste and, and although we would go but the smell and the taste for them, that register of that not being socially acceptable, that that having risks associated doesn't resonate in the same way very often. If you have a child who doesn't understand the social implications of that or the health risks of that, they're not going to register that as being any different from playing with the mud or the Play-Doh or anything else. And they may well do that with that too. Um, so for me, you know, there, there'll be parents out there that this is kind of commonplace and one of the few different things that feel a bit troubling. But it, usually when we're playing with poo, it's relating to our touch-based system and very often our smell-based system. Even with touch, it's more likely to be touch than taste when it goes to the mouth, um, which might make someone feel better. I don't know why, but it might. Um, and that um, if we're looking at that, what we need to say is, does that only ever happen in the bath or is it just greater opportunity for it and, and she feels like she needs to open her bowels in the bath? In which case, we've got, we want to look at, can we just change how that's happening? Can we initially put her in the bath and then take her out so that she can have a poo and then put her back in? Um, is it that actually she's screaming out for more touch or more smell? 
in which case we want lots of different touch experiences in the bath that she can explore that are more socially acceptable to us so that it doesn't bother us and we might try lots of different smell opportunities and you can do that and you can do it really easily with um you can do it with lemon juice toothpaste you can do it with little um smelly machines in the bathroom different things that allow her to explore that need in different ways that doesn't make us feel bad i doubt that she's feeling bad about that but what i do worry about in many children who explore in that way as their emerging awareness comes that then they have kind of feelings of, of guilt or a shame around that and I don't want them to do that so it's really important as well that we open up the conversation around that too and um, going forward if that applies to her too but I would very much be exploring lots of different smell and touch experiences for bath time I would also make sure that we do some proprioception before we get in the bath and some while we're in the bath and some when we get out of the bath because that will reduce that need to, to kind of explore things to calm. Um, so I might do things like use a, a nice dry towel and not a towel that you've dried in the dryer, one that you've dried on the line that's slightly rough like my nana used to use. And then I would rub them down nice and firmly, not to hurt them, but beyond just a nice smooth because the smooth stuff's alerting. Once we get through to pressure, that's calming. If you can rub them down all over their body first, They've got quite a lot of stimulus before they get in. If you put a, a small hand towel or a large flannel down on the bottom of the bath, do you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I got in our bath, we've moved house recently, and we've got a much smaller bath. And now I can sit in my bath and my feet press against the end. And I was thinking how much safer I feel in the bath and how much more relaxed I feel because I'm not slipping. Now, when you think of that in children's terms, Actually, baths are really tricky environments to maintain your position and keep yourself feeling right. So very often, if you've got someone who won't tolerate a slip mat, but even if they will, a towel gives more um, feedback back through. So having that on the bottom of the bath can make you feel more secure. It can also help you anticipate the bottom of the bath better. So those would help too. And rub them down at the end of the bath or do a nice little swaddle at the end of the bath um, that then creates that pressure back in. Those two things together might give us some, some stars for six to give us a, a chance of working it out some more. That's fantastic. And I just want to thank that attendee for asking that question, because what that's done has given us a brilliant overview of how to approach these things and the number of different things you can throw at any one situation that really helps it. So that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Well, I think that's all the questions um, answered. Um, I, for one, found that really, really um, a useful session. And thank you so much, Claire. And thank you very much to all the attendees that have attended today. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending because I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. It's much nicer talking to people in person, but I'm actually just relieved I don't have to wear a mask while I'm talking today. So that's great too. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much, for everyone. And remember, you'll receive some things in your inbox and look out on our website. You'll be able to see this. You'll be able to see our, our sunny faces as many times as you like. You can replay the presentation um, and all the information, particularly the further reading, will be on your slides. Thanks very much, Claire. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.